spread more on meet, meeting man's need through worship. That's more on the psychological side of things. We're going to see a bit of the psychology behind it. How does personal man gets affected by worship and um, what is his basic purpose? What is the basic purpose of worship? So, we see that the, uh, we already discussed, discussed the, the meaning of the word worship in the first session, which is very important and also very interesting. Uh, but the primary purpose of any kind of worship, of anyone, worship is not limited, as I must say, when we go on, uh, it's important that is that worship is not limited. To, to the Christian culture or, or familiar religion culture. Worship is a broad term for all cultures of people worshipping anything. It's a broad term. It just means that the people of the culture by a certain attribute or respect or certain amount of worth or value adds value to something, to their God it, or deity in their religion. So it's a much broader term. So therefore we can say the primary purpose of worship in any culture is to appease God, to win His favor and His protection. We can see that in so many religions. The previous lesson that we did, we studied the worship outside of Israel and the, the gods and the deities in that, those religions we could see that the people were trying to appease their God in some way. They were like nature-related deities. And they, in, in a way, through nature, tried to appease God, like bringing offerings. Um, you get the libation um, uh, uh, offerings, like pouring out drink or water or anything on the ground. Water in those days were precious as it is becoming today when it's drought. But water was very precious in those. Even to pour out water on the ground was a sacrifice. It was a form of sacrifice. I will leave in some food left over for the day or the first, the best of the food for the day to, to come and eat it. Well, just leave it there on the altar or on the shrine, at the shrine, wherever. And the deity would come and, and eat the food. How do people never realize that except for being stolen that it will never be taken away, it will remain there until it rots. But I think the idea was just in a way to respect the deity for that. Mm. So therefore any kind of way to win God's favor, to make promises, to, 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 to use curses, blessings, whatever way they were trying to do to get favor with their God. We can see that kind of behavior also in the, uh, Elijah and the prophet of Baal on the Mount Carmel. I think that's very clear there. Eh? What they did there to get to win Baal's fa favor, cutting themselves, shouting, and then Elijah had a kind of a fun time with them. He said, maybe he's busy, he's gone to the loo <laughs> or some place. He's not can't hear you, you're wasting your time. I think they were much more interesting. I think prophets were much more, less formal and that we can even imagine. I think he was making fun of them. Hmm. But in some way, people are trying to get the favor of the gods and their protection, of course, because in this world, man's experience as a, as a mortal, fleshly being Protection is of vital importance. If we live in an unstable situation like we, at the moment also, we know that you as a mortal person will always like our protection. So there is something behind that. The New Testament emphasis though is one on total shift in that. So there has been something already done by the God in that has brought the emphasis on gratitude towards what already been done. That is the emphasis of New Testament. That, that we find right through um, this man's beautiful uh, concept is that we don't 
work on appeasing God. We work out of God being already happy and satisfied and blessing us and then we respond with an attitude of gratitude. Personality force and relationship is of vital importance in our religion while other religions do not have a real personal relationship with the God. We, the Bible has got the opposite view of that God is very personal and we can relate to Him. Man, as a created being in God's image, can communicate with God. That's possible. A creature and his sinfulness, there, there are two levels of reaction that he can have. He can either bow down in humility and reverence, uh, uh, being humble and on his place, or he can be just gratitude. I think there are more than those two reactions, but those are mentioned by the author. Now we can look at the types of worship. There are two types mainly that he mentions. And in, in, in the way he, at the way he looks at, 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 at the uh, subject, he mentions ceremonial. That uh, is the I eat relation. That is a more colder kind of relation in worship. That means it refers to the outward acts that one does. You can take that to any religion that's got outward acts. You can some do this, others do other things. Uh, like some people have the, uh, uh, the some religions have the habit of like offering sacrifices. Other religions have as other habits of maybe uh, um, segregate yourself to some spot and stay there. Um, um, completely separate yourself from society. Um, Withhold certain kinds of foods. That are all, those are all the outward acts of their religion. It doesn't really say anything of what's going on inside of them. Right? Just, just for the outward side. The, 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 the ceremonial focuses on that man is sinful and because of that is unworthy. That results in sacrifices. He is trying to get to God. He knows he, he becomes aware of the fact that he's sinful because of that he's trying to do something about it. That those are the reasons for the acts. The danger is that in activities with, can be there without any worship. And uh, this he says more related to our kind of worship. That we can be involved in so many activities in church wherever that we lose sight of what worship is really about, that it's something of the heart. On the, the personal is the other kind of worship, that is the kind we like more. I think that's the kind the Bible talks about a lot and would promote, if I may say. It's the I thou, in other words, you're talking to another person. And that's a, a way of having fellowship with God. I can say a lot through this if I look at Cain and Abel's sacrifices and the way they dealt with it. Mm. It's a big lesson to learn about the way. That the one clearly showed a more relational attitude towards God because he gave God what he had. He was atoning for his sinfulness. For all we know, he was also trying to atone for his brother's sinfulness. That's another subject that but at least he was trying to atone for his sinfulness. And he, he knew God in the sense that he knew God like blood sacrifices. Because that was God's way of dealing with it. From the start. All over, right through the Old Testament, we find that the Lord is a peace with blood sacrifices. Which is actually a referral to later Christ's death on the cross. And well, Cain didn't, he brought only vegetation as sacrifice. So it was not that he was completely not doing anything or that it was less worth. It was the way in which God perceived his sacrifice, not the way he expected. He was, he was giving, I think he was giving God what already belonged to God. 
Zij winnen. He was giving to God what already belonged to God. It wasn't a sacrifice. It wasn't a sacrifice. Okay, the danger of having been too personal is that you can sit with familiarity without dignity. That's what we're also getting. God becomes everyone's pal in such a way that there's no more separation. God is not holy okay. anymore. That's a and we get that much in the Western culture of today. Definitely, we find that, that there's something in the culture which makes Jesus somebody's pal. Now, I would... I don't know what's worse. Yeah, we don't know. At each level there is a bad side to it and, and God wants us to relate to Him, but if you relate to Him as those who probably, you probably don't understand anything about Him. Uh, steps leading to worship. Okay, now we get to the way of how do you grow, what makes man that he grows towards worship? What makes him come to worship? The, the first one is awareness of the need to worship him. Before man would worship God at all, there must be something inside of him that makes him, tells him, listen, I, there is a God and I need to find out about him or I must in a way pay respect towards him. Man has been always aware that the, of the existence of God. Nature proclaims it all over. So the only way man to, even today man becomes aware of God is through crisis and needs. Is that not true of all of our lives in some way? Uh, the new approach of God is of course not through that. That's not God's first way of it. How he wants to communicate with us. That is man's ultimate approach to God. Or, or that is God's ultimate way. If you can put it in a uh, rephrase. It, that's God's ultimate way of reaching man. Otherwise man would be dead for God. He closes his ears and his eyes and says, I oh, want nothing to do because the only thing that he gets is remind, a reminder of his sinfulness. That is in this old approach of trying to appease God, get to Him, and then get Him to do a lot of things that you need. <laughs> Spiritual manipulation. Spiritual manipulation. But the first step is to become aware. Then, when he becomes aware of that, he's seeking a solution to find meaning in this meaningless life. He is trying to get to some something that would tell him what's going on in this world and how can I solve the problem? What can I do? Where must I find the truth? Where must I find the solution? Where must I find God that will help me to give, to give me what I need? Let alone what I want because then only to get by in this world and more so the world of, uh, of the Old Testament or further back um, it, that world that the silly people lived in was much rougher than what we have today. We don't live in that kind of environment. We've, we've actually organized an environment to, to cancel out the big need for God. That is why people today can, in a way, get by without being aware of God or without being want to seek him even though they are aware of him. You know, there's technology that can fix you. <laughs> too much technology. Too much technology. technology. Too much technology that can fix everything. Yeah, too, very true. Evaluation and establishment of worship patterns. Of course, then when he seeks a solution, then he will evaluate if this solution is satisfying to his needs. Is this really bringing him Closer is, is in a way is the searching his soul, met with an answer, is a meaning in his life in what he found. And through that he will obviously also establish a pattern of worship out of that. For instance, if you find nothing, turn his back on God, on the church, meaning that he says the answer is not in church in Christianity, he will probably turn his back and say, I'll not worship any God. I'm the God. Or you will just say there is no God and being agnostic. Or say God is or atheistic and being agnostic say no God is but we really can't know him. It's not to be known. That's the word agnosticism comes from the 
with Agnu, which means you cannot go in. May that the Paul found on the written to the agnostic or, or to the agnostic one on one of this, the, the uh, uh, idols he found in Athens. Isn't agnostic also one who finds, isn't um, No, that's Gnosticism. Gnosticism is not so That is uh, yeah. knowledge. Uh, no, no, I can two words. Yeah, that's no. superior knowledge. No, no. A in front of Gnosticism mm -hmm. means to yeah. not be able to know. The A. Mm. He called it the Alpha Privative. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm with you. Okay. okay. Uh, worship of the total man. Uh, well, uh, Vigil makes mention of worship of the total man, but in this case he's actually talking of the total soul, because he, uh, soul is divided up in mind, emotions and will. Mm. So, if we, uh, he, God promotes, or God wants us to know him in total, in the totality of our soul. He doesn't want only one aspect of us to worship him. Now, he didn't discuss the man as a tri as a tri unit, in other words, as body, soul, and spirit, he only looked at the soul part in this case. I believe you can also discuss body, soul, and spirit and see how you worship God with your body, which is a very New Testament Paulinian type of way of thinking. It's a sacrifice, but just as it's a living one. Yeah, it's the Paulinian way, which we discussed in the first chapter. We can say the soul, which is discussed now, we can say also the spirit. To worship in spirit is an aspect that the New Testament many times mm. talk about. Familiar, very familiar uh, uh, idea, term in the New Testament. Well, we and me are just going to touch on the mind and emotions and well, I the soul. The idea, if you think of God, if you view God as an idea, your worship will be intellectual, so says people. If you think more, think about God. If you think God is a, a thing you must think out, idea in other words, then you will have an intellectual approach. Hmm. If you think of God on emotional terms, with your emotions, experience God, like have all kinds of experiences, your worship will be only experience and not much thought about God. Yeah. You will try to cut the thoughts out because that will maybe spoil your idea of what you experience in your emotion. It's a very dangerous place to be to have only emotions. No, it's a very Eastern. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's very Eastern. It's what very Eastern. Eastern. But I can also say that the first one will be very too much intellectual and also not be no, I mean, if it's just intellectual, it's also no. a problem. Now I tell you, both of these two aspects have been very much in the church been explored and many people, Christians, are there today. But there's another one that we normally forget and that's the hardest part. <laughs> if, any, if only it's mind and emotions and there's no decision to act out of God's will, I say, if, if only your mind and emotions is involved, then there's no decision to act out of God's will. In other words, you can know a lot, you can have a lot of experience, but it may be that that knowledge and experience of feelings never get you so far as to go and do God's will. That's why we need to stand still at the third part of this one, that is the will power. Man, if there's some place I can buy willpower, I would run after it. Yeah. I think that's the biggest problem. Yeah, there's so much trouble. training intellectually. There's so much ex time for experience through nowadays through the media. In the time this book was written, I don't even think the church had nearly the 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 um, the, the opportunity to experience God in a way that we with our multimedia and sudden action cameras everywhere we can have the latest testimony or story we got at if we only think of ma the making of a, a how much how much how much revival had it brought not much but I think the problem is in the third aspect of doing gospel 
Because real change and real power comes through the people who worship God in that third aspect as well. As well. I think that's where we all are lacking. So yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. is the biggest problem up till now I can find. But everyone can decide for himself where you lie. If you only intellectually, you definitely need more of an emotional and people's experience. If you have an intellectual will, it may be that your life will feel a bit dried up. So God wants you also to experience His love. Let me be talked about it. We definitely no, need definitely. that. No, definitely. Definitely. No, definitely. That's part of our human being emotions. Well, if you take it, what kind of emotions Jesus had, we can't really always understand. But He also had emotions. Very human emotions. On, the, on another level sometimes. Um, he was in contact with God in another way that we don't understand always. We don't always understand the way he was communicating with his father and what he meant. But in a way, every human being to some degree needs some kind of experience of God in their life somehow. They need kind of a type of intellectual, intellectual side, which is someone or a teaching about God. And then they just need to exercise that. And through that growing they will power. <laughs> Let's look at a bit of me uh, at music in worship. Music is a way to express your attitude. Uh, I can just have a personal note, being involved in, in worship in church as well, instrumental and and leading worship in church. I can tell you this is one of the most important aspects of worship in the church and people's experience that you can ever find. I don't think any, anything else has the impact of what music has. Even in the world as in a broad way, which is not always spiritually sound, but music has a big, big impact in many people's lives. In my life it had an impact like nothing before. And I think the, the music experience in the church is of vital importance, of what place it takes during a worship service. And it can never be belittled, and nothing can take this place if it's not in place. So I believe before people can really sit down, well, now must be careful because it is possible for people to get teaching and learning without having an experience. They can still be much blessed by the word itself or by preaching as such. But I believe the, the, the worship experience in the church for music is vitally important. Okay, now he talks, this person talks about music. We will more discuss us about the singing of hymns in the church. Hymns that are selected for man to come into dialogue with God. And that is how all music in church should be like. That put you in a dialogue with God, where you talk to God um, through hymns. That, that uh, G with a small letter is a mistake. I don't know why, how it could in, but should be a capital letter. Speaking to God with a capital letter through hymns. If you read, uh, uh, if you look at the hymn in church which you sing, um, our God is an awesome God. I mean, immediately, it, 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 it would join up with emotions you where, where you experience God as an awesome God in your life, maybe the same day you sing it, mm -hmm. or in the previous time just before the worship service. Some way, or in your life before, you've somehow had the experience about God, this is also God, and seeing that together and, and worshipping it on, on, on a, is, is, is a way of where you can find God in your life. And, 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 and it can attach to your emotions very clearly. And that will help you to at least open up more. Now music has been in both the Old and New Testament has played a major role in many people's lives. Uh, we, can, we can just look at the Psalms. The whole book of Psalms is a hymn book. It's an old hymn book. So putting music to that would 
be a blessing like people have done before. Um, music in the Old Testament is not only David. There are many other places where, where, where people have come, like the Psalms of Solomon. It's probably also a lot of music songs uh, which were sung. Um, look at Jehoshaphat marching up, putting the whole worship team in front of the battle <laughs> and winning the battle that way. Music in God's way. God had a very, very, very prescriptive way of how the musicians should play and how they should act and what they should do. They were different instructions to musicians. And when they don't do what God tells them to do, they will not full part of God's plan of worshipping a Bible. So if music is that important, then it's very important that music has the correct theology. Yeah, um, uh, music and theology, that's, <laughs> that's another story for another day. How are you going to put words to, the, to music to make it the right theology? I think if you have a right theology inside of you, the music you will make will definitely portray it. I'm sure of that. Bishop leader is really, his aim is to put the glory of God and to bring, help you to bring you into this presence of God through the Holy Spirit so that you can worship God in the right way. That is the purpose of a worship. New Testament, definitely a lot of music, angel chorusing at Jesus' birth. Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn just before they left after the, the last communion. The Lord's Supper, and the the the, the, um, the first communion, uh, they they sang a hymn when they went out before they went out. Paul and Silas sang in prison, and a lot of things happened there. There was an earthquake because of that. Um, and Paul himself urges us to sing songs and melodies, make noise before the Lord. The walls of Jericho. Yeah, there's that example of the walls of Jericho. Um, was also an important master in worship. I mean, that was worship. What, like, uh, what's it for, Wilbur? When we worship, the line of Judah roars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the other side of it, the, the other opposite side of it, when the three men, Sadrach, Meshach, and the big big go, yeah. they were supposed to worship, worship the king when the instruments were playing, and they didn't yeah, worship. Yeah. So that's another side of looking at it. So yeah. for them to fall down at the play of that instrument would, would have been seen as worshipping, even though it was not in their hearts. And they decided, no, they are not going to stand right up and don't take part in that kind of worship. Um, on another level, worshipping in, uh, 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 in, in a, uh, music in a disco, in a normal secular disco, it's not worship to God, it's definitely worship to some other deity. And definitely not to the glory of God and will have vast consequences in people's life if they listen to music attached to that. So music has a kind of powerful influence on people and can be used in a wonderful way to bring people closer to God. And it can also take people away from God or keep, him, keep people away from God and His presence. The purpose of music in worship, it creates awareness of God, of course, we know that, we experienced that before. And it, it creates a mood for worship in general. Okay? It creates a mood if you're in church, then people will probably start shouting out from themselves, God is good, God. That is what you want to say. If the pastor in front of the church do not say, you, you feel like screaming out and tell people, God is good. Or somebody elder or somebody in church will pray out and tell God how good he is. That is a normal result of if the worship has hit the mark. Okay. It encourages a spirit of reverence. You can really feel God is here. And we worship Him. And He's close. You have got reverence for God. It's expressing our inner feelings. You can complete the list. 
No need for me to say anything more about that. Now we come to the types of music, instrumental, choral, and congregational. I don't think there's anything else than that. Sometimes people would just put on instrumental music to create a mood, especially in before a service starts. In some degree that works, because immediately we will be in, a, in, a, in, in the presence of God of worship with music and talk on the lighter matters of life. It happens, but it will be more difficult. It actually will actually be favorable that we have good instrumental music as well. It can also be very much to the glory of God. Choral, choral, is, uh, choral is for those churches who can accommodate a, like a choir. Because a choir, I think, it looks like we, will, we talk more of a worship team. In other words, groups of people with one or two people singing and the rest playing instrument, forming a group and making music together. The old idea of a choir in church, having maybe an organ or one instrument and then a choir singing, that is a concept in certain places but not very known in our culture. Maybe in, in cultures uh, different than I'm used to, or you get in African culture a lot of choir choral music, but then it, it flows over to congregational music. The whole congregation could seem like a choir. So there is not always a. The Negro Baptists in America, they love it. Yeah, well, I think that is more or less what this book is written at the background of yeah, the background. Yeah, choral, choral choirs is definitely. Yeah, and, and choral can be wonderful. I mean, if you even listen today about um, uh, 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 examples of, of choral music, uh, oh, that can be can, can bless one tremendously. Choice of hymns. They are full. There are matters to consider when you you choose a hymn. Uh, 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 of course, a uh, little. Uh, very much suggested that uh, the program of the church should be given a hit so that the choir can practice their songs before the Sunday comes. Nowadays we get more like just a worship team would practice and they would have a few songs and the congregation would join in. And nobody before would actually know exactly what the theme is, it will become clear as when they have the worship. In at the beginning of the service. There are questions to ask when we ask when we select a hymn. I hope I've got it here. It looks like it's in the book but not here. Maybe you should look a bit at that. I just want to find it in the book quickly. Uh, so that we can Maybe discuss that. I think it's very important to look at the four questions that we need to ask. Now, it's just below the choice of hymns. Is it for the, the, the hymns appropriate with worship on page 37, mm -hmm. middle? The, the hymns which are appropriate for worship should pass the following test. Is the content Christian? Yeah. At least we should ask that. Yeah. Is the content really Christian? Or, or, is the guy using Christian words like the Lamb, Jesus sacrificed the cross, <coughs> the uh, biblical terms reminding people of that we have to do with the Bible, uh, 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 um, instead of being involved in another religion? You know? um, today, especially, I think with, the, uh, with our pluralism, with the problem of pluralism, even in the church and in our society, people may easily be tempted to leave out biblical terms, afraid of, of um, uh, uh, offending anybody else of other religions, which is absolutely Obviously. not the way we should go. We should definitely be Christian in our statements and say it without fear or without. You know what's a sad thing is that other people are very vocal about their own religions. Yeah. Why are the Christians always stepping back? 
We don't need to step. We don't have we to need step. To put that we need to put our hymns and exactly. uh, let the whole world see, talk about the cross, the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice. If they are offended with that, so then they are offended. Then it's a righteous offense. And the theology and spirit of them should be worthy of the dignity of God. Put God in the right way. Don't put him in a wrong way. Well, that is Christian. That is the meaning of Christianity. It's a biblical Christianity. Obviously, that should be. How can you have anything else in a biblical Christianity? Biblical and Christianity are two words meant to be together. There's no Christianity except the biblical one because in no other place you learn of, of Christ as the scripture. So that should be the way. Okay. Do they express Christian feelings and experiences in a worshipful attitude? Okay, now it's more on the side of the emotions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are artists really creating the right emotion? Or is it creating a wrong emotion, like a, like a critical negative experience? You want people to walk out of church and feel negative about God or all about the worship, about anything. You don't want to put people off in that way. If they are offended, they must be offended at the gospel, the true Christian gospel. And nobody, no place where you have a real worship service will people be negatively influenced or put off. Do they have quality of style? Now we come to the more practical side of worship. Uh, a person who just wrote a few words that, that is falsely sung in church and not really well prepared and music that's slothful, made out of or, or, or sluggishly uh, put together or anything like that in, in low quality is not to the glory of God. It shouldn't be really recorded and put in church. So, so the, the quality should be there, and style as well. Are they practical and appropriate for the congregation? Now that's more related to congregation, which is actually the question, because normally it is presented to congregation. Is it appropriate? Because sometimes certain things aren't appropriate at that stage. Um, to, if people are really um, uh, in earnest, on a certain subject in the church at that time and somebody comes with totally another thing it may be inappropriate to sing a song like that it's very difficult to just come up with example now but there are definitely examples where a song would be inappropriate not because the song is bad, it's bad style, not because it's not Christian, not worshipping but because it's not suitable for that time ok now we've dealt with the four questions to ask by selecting hymns, you can carry on with prayer. Now, if we would pray more, <laughs> we would actually worship more. more. <laughs> and, and let me put it the other way around. If we don't pray, we've got few other places to do we really worship? <laughs> I mean, except for our lifestyle, but prayer is a worship. To think of prayer as worship is actually very really sound thought. Because that is what Vietnam also says is dialogue. Worship is dialogue with God. Prayer is dialogue with God. I mean, there are few things that express worship in such a powerful way as prayer. Prayer is your ultimate worship, I believe. Um, uh, music may be stirring up your emotions, but kneeling down and praying to God, talking to your Father is the ultimate way of how you can worship. That is actually, if we go down to the first chapter where we studied the word uh, uh, worship, shachach, and also proskuneo in Greek, bending the knee, prostrating for God, that's what you do when you pray. So prayer is very much, definitely, very much the same as worship in the Bible. They, they, they went completely, they went flatly. Yeah, no, prostrate means falling on your face even. Oh, oh, well, yeah. Why do people pray? 
Oh, man, there may be lots of reasons why people pay something just out of need. Yeah, no, no. Uh, okay. Do we allow people to pray haphazardly? What? We uh, talked about this word haphazardly. I think he's got a more formal way of a church setting where, where everything is on his place. The pastor is here praying rightly, everybody is appropriately praying haphazard prayer. In him would then be people coming out with a prayer request that doesn't coincide with anything that's happening at the moment. Uh, praying at basically, I think people might be put off. People are thinking of God as decent or Christian religion as decent or a worship service as decent. But I think that not praying at all because you're afraid of praying at basically. In that case, I would disagree with people. But if he talks about that, we don't want people to come in and start praying for stuff that doesn't fit to the situation. If you want to pray for your, um, something that you've lost, the worship service is not the place to come and pray for it. Uh, that's a one stupid example of it, but that should... You have to draw your focus on God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and you about. don't want to take yeah. people's focus in the worship service or from the main theme and what you are busy doing. Then. Prayer and exploiting God for uh, for your own needs. I think we're all guilty of that. Mm. To some degree, we are all guilty of, in a way, exploiting with inverted commas, exploiting God for our own needs. Really, um, if you look at the Lord's Prayer, which we will come to, oh, well, that's the next one, I can see that was the next point. If we look at the Lord's Prayer, it's everything but exploiting God for anything. The first three items on the Lord's Prayer is just about who God is, His kingdom, His name, His will. It was all Him. And only in the next, in the fourth to the seventh or eighth um, verse, or the first theme, the, the fourth to the seventh, I think, then we get to our needs, which are also just limited. It's just you just you say to you that yeah. he's providing your needs. Yeah, we, we, we pray for our daily bread, and even only daily, we don't pray for bread for years to come. So in other words, multitude of mm. desiring is just for our needs for today. We can ask God for. So in that, if you really follow, if you know the Lord's Prayer and follow it to a degree, you will never really come to exploiting God in your prayer. His kingdom, His will, His name, very important things. To go make a study of the Lord's Prayer and see if you, how does that come to what you do when you kneel to pray? Is that first on your lips? If we must be honest, we will say hardly. First, normally we come to pray as God, I, tomorrow I'm going to do this, will you help me to do it? Lord, I'm going to have to do this, will you protect me in that situation? Normally we have a long list of, like a shopping list for God to do. We are all guilty of that, we can't find it, but God's model prayer is really focusing on God's needs first before we get to our own. I think that's very really sound. What does it really mean for us, this Lord's Prayer? Well, he, uh, Vittel has done the, the uh, Lord's Prayer there and he's mentioned all the elements, which you can go and study it in your book. I'm not going to do that because I don't think we really have time to go into all of that. Um, there's, there's, there's some really good theology in the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, definitely. Thy kingdom come. Yeah, there's uh, prayers like a uh, 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 prayer of adoration, a prayer of consecration and submission, mm. a prayer of petition, mm. a prayer of determination and dedication, and then a doxology and a praise. That's a wonderful example of prayer. We'll give a couple of minutes. Yes. Then we get to liturgical versus spontaneous Prayers. We've done in the first chapter, we've done something about that word liturgical. It comes from the, uh, the, the New Testament liturgia, which means service-like, if I can translate it that way. Service-like, opposite that is more formal, versus spontaneous prayer, which is best. Well, 
You can't really say which is best. Everything has its place. But we, there's always a balance in these things. We can either go to too formal and then become like certain traditional churches where we just fall into formalism which folks prays in a, in, in a non-understandable language which the church did for years in Latin maybe they read all the, these Latin words and the people don't really know what it means anyway even if they understand the Latin to a certain degree they don't even know what it means that they say all these things and then we can opposite of that we get spontaneous prayers I think in, in a way we have to choose in favor of the more spontaneous prayers but that comes out of people's hearts that's real reality that's religion that's the way we communicate um, we can't really judge any kind any prayer in some way that people can have a little book full of prayers and read that and it can be meaningful there is a place for that but I'd rather say in a, in a service or in a place, spontaneous prayers are good. Mm. And the, 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 if there is liturgical prayer, it should be really be, um, be part of a preparation by the pastor, not only a reading because there's nothing else to do. Or to fill up the time or to keep people from having spontaneous prayer. That would really not do Will you have an agenda? Yeah, I'll do it with you. Yeah. If you have an agenda. Hopefully no pastor or spiritually will have an agenda of keeping people busy with nonsensical stuff in the church. No, well, they've got a mission. No. They've just got to pray for that thing. I mean, oh, no, no, please. Then they keep people away from being spontaneous. I, I, that is I, wrong. I get in the word. Yeah. Um, Which is best? Prayers during worship service. Formal. They are prayers worked out for worship service. Like what is this, the Lord's Prayer? And, and the Bible is full of prayers. I mean, you can go and there are many prayers in the Bible. I think some of the shocking and Moses, the, Moses, Moses prayers. Yeah, and I had guts. <laughs> and David's prayers. <laughs> to leave alone. Yeah, David's David prayers are praying uh, for the Lord to be, avenge his enemy. Of course, that will also be very careful with selecting that and how you present that. And you must think a pastor now. You are trying to be a pastor. If you want to be a pastor, you can address people and be a leader. There's a big responsibility of not falling into a complete, um, a, a very simplistic, um, spontaneous mode of being just familiar and talk about familiar stuff and have your own private conversation and only you know what's going on. But you must be relevant and having the people's with you, but not taking them to a place where they shouldn't be. Mm. So there need to be a lot of preparation, prepare for the time, pray, Lord, what shall I say here? What need to do? You always need God's wisdom. So preparation for prayer, even, even for prayer is also important. I think vehicle space is that. And you look into that. In the end, what you're going to do with that will be what you are going to do with it in the end. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to really sit there and evaluate you what you're going to do. Okay, now we get to the Word of God in worship. Mm -hmm. The Word of God being the Bible. Ah, my favorite. Second half of the service is, well, uh, Bible speaks of worship in terms of the worship service. So he says this, the first half was we talking to God in a way. We talk to Him, we do prayer, we do worship. And then God speaks to us. Now that's a very, if I may say, a rigid way of looking at it. Because a dialogue is not always one person speaking, finish, and then the other person speaks. It's, it's a dialogue the whole time. In other words, even though the congregation may be in prayer, people may be reading the word uh, uh, in the time of open, of open uh, ministry. People will be reading this word and some, uh, something will strike them and then they will come up and read it. So the, wording of the, 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 the reading of the word of God may be not only the pastor at the end preaching. Maybe a combination of a lot of things. But traditionally I think we, we used to think that 
the, the pastor preaching to people and then that's the only way it should be. It should not be like that. It could be different. It could be much different. That some people will bring a word of God, uh, uh, reading a piece of scripture that's relevant to the situation without the pastor being aware of it or prepared for it or whatever the case may be. Free churches, and that is what we, uh, free churches being free from traditions, that's what free means. Eh? Free churches have scripture reading also in the beginning or at the end. You see, so you got scripture reading all our way, you don't need to have it limited to only the parts of preaching. Here's an interesting thing uh, that I've put in. This is my remark that there was a, a theologian with the name of Carl Buck. If we talk about the Holy Spirit in Scripture, he says that the, the Scripture itself, although we call it the Word of God, becomes more like the Word of God when it is in an environment where the Spirit wants to minister to people. If I can interpret in those terms, he put in more theological terms what it means. He said that the Scripture becomes the Word of God. Because the Scripture can always, always also be misused by people. So in that sense, we can understand what my Karl Marx would, would say that theologically. He's uh, gone and revised a lot of things he said about that again. That, uh, if, if that would imply that the Bible is not the Word of God, that would be a wrong implication. So we stick to the fact that the Bible is the Word of God to mankind. Although we say there's a more, very much more uh, contextual way of how the Scripture could be meaningful in our lives, being spiritually at the right place where the Spirit of God uses it to talk to people. Well, I'm going to step off from this. This is a long, uh, a very debatable issue. Yeah, I'm not going to touch on that any further. The Word of God, Old Testament, was respected by Jesus. He read it in the synagogue. So Jesus has already also used the Word of God. That time, of course, the Old Testament, there was no New Testament. The New Testament was only written 30 years at least after Jesus was on earth. So there's no way, or at least 20 years after that. So there's no way in any way that he, anybody could have read the New Testament. But Jesus loved the Old Testament. If we go to that uh, chapter Luke 4, I think, where he's in a synagogue in, in his hometown and he read from the Isaiah, Isaiah 61, where he read about his own ministry. So he respected the word, the way he handled the situation, taking up the skull, opening, and there was a piece there that was meant to be there at that stage. It shows you had very much respect for the way in which the synagogue was run there, and he had no real problem with any of the, the practical formalities of that. His problem was more with what was happening in the hearts of people and how. It, how did they interpret their own Bible? That was more of a concern with Jesus, what went in, on, in, on, in their hearts. What went on in their hearts. He quoted everywhere and especially on the cross. How many scriptures were quoted on the cross? So Jesus was very relevant with the word of God. It was part of him and in his preaching as well. Okay, now we come to preaching. Vittel calls it a downward movement. Uh, it sounds a bit rough if you talk about a downward movement. Mm. But he meant by that more like God is talking now and everybody else should be quiet and listen to the sermon. That is more or less traditionally how people of the era of the 60s and 70s and 80s would view how a church service should go. I think but nowadays the things Things have changed a bit. I think there's more a spontaneous way of how people react. Although there is still a time period in which somebody in front, a pastor, will take up and, and explain to people what is in the Bible in a certain verse. There will still also always be time for that. 
thing because that may open up a lot of things in people's lives if somebody with insight in the word of God taking time to study it and explain it to people who do that that also puts a heck of an em emphasis and a, 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 a an emphasis on the fact on his preparation that he he should stand up to what he's doing there. He should be very serious about the time he's given there and do a lot of preparation and study work about the subject and pray a lot about that and make sure he has the revelation from God what to do with the scripture he's been given. If God has laid scripture on his heart, he must really make sure that God leads him with the scripture in when he has the time in preaching. In free churches, the preacher speaks for God. Now, what exactly the free churches mean here in terms of the preaching, I don't understand people 100% completely because Free church is a free of tradition and preaching is very traditional. So in a way, free ch churches are also in a way traditional if it comes to preaching, if that is what he says here, if that is true. It should be well prepared, of course, yes. The purpose is to make meaning of scripture clear to the hearers. Unfortunately, I find that not really the case in many cases with the preachers. I think they prepare something and they just giving you the old stuff over and over and again without really chewing it and really getting the juice out of it and really finding the, the hidden jewels, treasures that God has put in the scripture. Finding that, that's a lifelong search, that's a, being serious about the Word of God, chewing on it, studying the material, studying the languages behind it, if you can. If not the languages, at least the explanation of the languages. There are so many um, helpful uh, 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 items that you can use nowadays. I mean, like Bible programs of explaining the, the original meaning very more clearly. If a person just make honest, earnestly, with those few things, he can go a long way. Spend enough time praying to, for God to open up the scripture to him in his preparation. Right, I've got the criterion of worship. Okay, I don't think I have, I have anything more to say on this subject. What is left there you can read. I think we come to the end of this chapter 2. Attempts at worship assume various forms and occur at different places. Reality in worship requires a constant consciousness of forgiveness and a sense of fellowship with God. Too often, worship services are designed simply to appeal to the intellect or to the emotions of the worshippers. In seeking an awareness of God's presence, some people may gather in a plain meeting house on a Sunday morning. The floor may be barren, the walls unadorned, and the benches straight and hard. Yo, this is it. In the end, we have to really define narrowly what worship really means. If everything is comfortable in our world, we can still actually maybe better worship. Worship is not limited to any of the things that give us comfort. They sit in silence and wait. Perhaps one will be led of the Spirit to express a brief audible prayer, another a few words of meditation, and another a brief reading from a book. Revivals have started that way. When people just come in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of waiting on God and a spirit leading the way, revivals have taken place. So maybe we should look again of what we really think of how the church should go, what we really should do. 
Meaning that this is very in very abnormal circumstances, but we live in abnormal circumstances. We can take this up more seriously. Read through that criterion of worship at the end of chapter 2, I think is very rich. Just maybe a way of in the end summing up of what we've been talking about the whole time. Let's recap quickly. Okay, let's stop processing now we can carry on. In the previous chapters, we first looked upon the nature of worship in chapter 1. We looked at the whole scenario of where worship comes from, what's the meaning of the word, and in the, how is it used in the Old and New Testament, and how it was used in the centuries after Christ, and where it's developed, and what it is developed in. To. And then in chapter 2, we've looked about the more the, the meaning, the meaning of worship and the sociological side of it, and how it pans out and what it means in practical sense. Now we come to the third chapter to planning and leading worship. If you are a, a pastor, hopefully that is what you will become, a, a spiritual leader in, in a congregation, then you will have to in a way administer or lead this process of how worship will go in the congregation. Things won't happen on itself. You will have to play a role and give a leading role in what will happen in the congregation with worship. If you, you don't do anything, you can't expect much to happen because the people will look up to you and say, Pastor, what do you do? What do you want us to do? Reverend Pastor, what do you want us to do here? What is going to happen here? And that is where we come in. We have to plan the order of worship. He discusses uh, progressive steps to enrich and exclude hindrances. Um, worship already exists there. It is already in the congregation. It is there. But there needs to be a focus that can help it to enrich the worship. So I will make it better so that it, it will reach its target better. And also to ex ex exclude other Exclude hindrances that will deny people worship. People will come on a Sunday, they will come on a Sunday and have a big expectation God will meet their need inside. We've already looked at that. People's got a need to worship God. Whether they have got a Christian commitment or not, we're looking broad about people are people. They come in and they are people, they sit there, they've got a need. And somehow the worship needs to target then that they can be turned around inside. And that is where we need to like more sharpen our instruments. Planning of worship in scriptures, prayers and hymns. The pastor needs to come and do a lot of homework before he comes into a Sunday morning walk inside the building and starts uh, uh, doing his Sunday morning duty or his work and uh, unfortunately maybe it just become just a way of earning his money or a way of just working without having a bad motive for it. it may be just become another job he needs to really sharpen in there and, and think about the scriptures the prayers and the hymns or the songs that they're going to sing as uh, uh, as choir or mainly just as a, the whole congregation. That is in the end to meet the needs of people. No, I, I don't think the, the, the church is to have the place of mediator between God and man. The church is supposed to point you to the mediator, which is Christ. I think Do you feel that in a way, the so way things are going, that people too much come in the way of people? Yeah, I think sometimes no. the whole church activity thing becomes the mediator between them and God. Yeah. But well, actually, <coughs> it's not supposed to be. Actually. I think uh, Virgil has discussed also the meaning of the word church and service, which we did in the <laughs> first chapter. And in that, 
the way of serving the church, the, the, the role of the priest was to act as a mediator. type of mediator. Yes, he was uh, well, well, in that case, it's not the in the New Testament. The New Testament, no. the mediator one is Christ. Yes. So I don't think that is what we mean that he must do. He must not take the role of the mediator yes. in Christ. Yeah. The only way the worship leader must do is he must come in and present things that will uh, uh, attach you already to your already existent relation with God and yeah. lead you further in that. He cannot come in the atmosphere or the mood. Or the exactly. And, but in a way, he yeah. can come up and call you up to worship. But never ever in any way can he take the place of being a mediator between you and God. He can always present like the Lord's Supper. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, um, and it's not necessarily the church's fault sometimes. People are always trying to grasp for something that they can attach themselves to as a mediator. And sometimes yeah. the church activities become a... Yeah. Something that people can... And I, it's just something I've seen and I, and I see yeah. But, but the more. people are always, <coughs> should always be called in church services to have their own personal relationship with God apart from the, 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 the whole idea of the, the worship leader or the pastor being a liturgos, a, a, a liturgos, a guy who leading, is only leading as far as he's also got a relationship with God and you have one. If one of that is not the case, then it becomes instead of Jesus, instead of God, then this it's definitely wrong. No, it's just something that, that no. needs to be watched because you can become that for that person without you even knowing. Yeah, but no. the, the objects and balances for that no. uh, uh, in the plan in your planning, you must always think of you've got a whole congregation here. And you've got a lot of people's needs, but there are definite, definite checks and balances in Scripture prohibiting from you to become like that. Yeah. And, 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 and allowing people, and that is the way where the freedom comes in. Mm -hmm. You allow people to be themselves and you allow people to have a different opinion about the peripheral things. Mm -hmm. The peripheral things. Now, the peripheral things. People can make their own mind up about, uh, let's give an instance about if they need to do a certain thing, a right thing, of when to do it, for instance. They must have a, 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 a discernment in themselves of knowing this is not the right time to do it, but that is right. Only they will know that. If a, a person step into that place and tell them what to do exactly at the right time, then they are playing God in this thing, yeah. if I can say that. Yeah. Or at least a very strong. Yeah. Yeah. We are not to do, we are not to be treated by the pastor as children. That in later, in later chapters, lessons, you will find out that that will definitely not work in a, in a spiritual de democratic church. No. Because, or, or, and it touches on the whole issue of the priesthood of the believers. We come to that in chapter 5, we can have a long discussion in chapter 5, but if you really believe we are all priests before God, nobody is in front of anyone, that wouldn't happen. No. If, if you believe you, uh, like some churches do, that they believe a priest must do the work in the church, and you have no say, and then they make a distinction, and that becomes a dangerous theology, and it is still today, a dangerous theology where there are millions of followers with no responsibility for their lives. And that's why you, you get chaos. Well, that, that's, that's, that's you get chaos. That that you get a lot of people have. doing the wrong yeah. things and obtaining religion, following a religion, but no relationship with God whatsoever. No responsibility for their actions. There's a fine line there. Uh, I, I think as a pastor, I think it's important that you know that, 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 that these things. But the no, idea, yeah, I think the yeah. questions that I have for myself. Is this but people myself? will not stay in the church where the priest, they will not stay in the church unless there is a lot of benefits from that. If that is the case, unless they just follow a doctrinal death religion for no reason at all. No, 
Or they wouldn't mind. And then the church would have no influence on them anyway. Unless there's a lie being proclaimed. And <laughs> people follow the lie and they, they like the lie. But then they like the lie. Then no, so and, and, and if in other cases, you get, uh, in that case, you get uh, a, a group of people, that, of church that becomes a cult. When a guy takes in place the role of uh, make decisions for other people and they are enlightened people already, then he brainwashes them or in a way he gets their attention or he's sort of in a way deceiving them. But people can also out of their own choice be deceived. No. It's not always the leader's fault. No, that's what I'm saying. But sometimes it's it's natural outworking of a human being to look at something yeah. physical that they can that they because that, yeah. it's more relation. No, for I don't believe that. that you can, no. As a leader, you gotta always guard yourself yeah. of you becoming that. Yeah, you can never be that. You can't if you be follow the law the right way, you can never become that. But yeah. I understand what you're saying, and I agree. You should be on your guard not to take over this person of other people, but. Doing a planning service and doing the things that we see in the scripture, following it rightly, and having an open relationship with people, respecting their rights and learning from other people as a pastor, an open teachable spirit, if I can put it that way, will always prevent you from going there. Um, selecting the theme, take time, uh, distractions. Uh, you must know that they will, unless you. They say that unless you plan a thing, and if you don't, uh, if you fail the plan, you plan to fail. That's the expression I was looking for. <laughs> if you fail the plan, you plan <laughs> to fail. Yeah, no, that's a In other words, if you don't go and you plan a thing, a worship service, you plan a meeting, you plan the thing, with the leading of the Spirit, because the inside of you, you are a Christian, you've got the Spirit of God, He's leading you as a, He knows it, He's put the responsibility of the pastor on your shoulders. There's a place for you. It's a place of, 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 um, of, of preeminence. So you've got a good position as a leader. There is a role there. There is a respect. There needs to be a respect of people for your role as a leader. If that is all it is. Mm. You need to go and be a leader there. Do your own work, do your planning, plan the worship, whatever you're going to do. Sometimes you don't need to plan certain details, but there needs to be a plan for your worship, your prayers and your word. That needs to be done. Mm. There needs to be a plan. Uh, you, uh, to prepare for prayer could be debated. But to prepare for your music, you can still know there are some more appropriate songs and others and, and wash out the inappropriate songs. But generally your worship team tends to prepare that. Exactly, your just, worship team takes care yeah. of that. But you must have a relationship with them. No, well. definitely. I think it's good for you to also sometimes yeah. just to go through it. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Or oh, tell them, listen, I think about this theme. What do you guys have on your hearts? A good, there's nothing that can substitute a good relationship with you and your worship team, if you're a pastor. No, definitely. And of course, the main thing is your pre preacher. <coughs> then it all comes down to what you've put in. You cannot blame any mistake on anybody else. Mm. If you haven't prepared for your sermon thoroughly and do all your study work and everything, sorry, then if that fails, you are to blame. And you the leader. You cannot afford to make a mistake like that. Well, either way, you're going to take the lead. You're going to take the lead. <laughs> Choose a subject. How? Well, in your quiet time, go to God. Ask Him, Lord, what do you want me to preach about? Some people are found out that people are now selling me uh, 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 sermons over the internet. They're selling them? Well, in a way, you buy the sermons. They say, we've got sermons for... Really? For, for marriages, when you buy a marriage so I can set up sermons, put them on mine and sell them. No, well, they, they, they don't do it that way. They oh, only okay. say, uh, do you, do you, we've got uh, sermons for this kind of season of the year, we've got sermons in your Bible this season, you can have something to preach the whole year. <laughs> you never really have to go and ask God what does He want to do. That's not healthy. 
Now, I, I don't believe that either, but people do, do that. Right? I believe that God can keep the right shot with a crooked stick. No, no, true, but I mean, <laughs> that, that but, but people do that, and they are really upright in the heart, they really believe that's the way. In a way, they must be, for, be able for God to correct them as well. And say, no, today this is not going to work. If you be, but you must be very rigid person to do that, or you must be very lazy. Say, I'll just cough up a few sermons for the year. It's all been booked. My sermons are all booked. I choose a subject, how oh, we all know that happens, how oh, you can need to. He even, Vintel discusses even that. If you're in the an Easter season, you preach on something often, eh? of preaching Easter season, I preach something about Jesus on the cross. Yeah. No, no, definitely. But, but it needs also to be born in your heart. No, it's not a thing you think out and you do. So you, you shouldn't be sitting there without knowing what to do. Because the the Holy open the Holy Spirit, if you've got a personal life and a personal relationship with God, the Holy Spirit will touch on things in your life. That you even out of your own. Mm. If you have a dream, come and share the dream and make sure you study in light view of the word of God, make sure what you say is in line with the word of God. And I come talk a lot of nonsense to people and share your views on what God is. If the scripture is called a good, speaks the mind of God. It's already there. You don't have to reinvent it. But you can refresh it. Hmm. I can tell you later on about my own testimony about it, but I'm not going to do it now. Use the calendar, that's what he says. Use the calendar. There are definitely the advantages and disadvantages to that. The advantages are more in a way of comfortable and secure and um, you're not going to make a fool of yourself that there's nothing. But the disadvantage may up become formal, formalistic and dry up and everything, which is not a good thing. Right. Pastor, 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 you can fill in your own words there. Preparation, presentation, proclamation, dedication, and benediction. I may but just say a few. Um, preparation means that what you do at home. You go down, you sit, you pray, you ask God, you do your own personal Bible study and prayer, and God does things on your heart. And it reminds you of things you need to say to the congregation. He will speak to you because you will need the report and God knows that. And He knows you are waiting on Him to lead you. He will not completely fail you in that. He will definitely do something. Presentation means how are you going to bring that in the church? Uh, present yourself to God. That's actually what He means by that. To present yourself to come before God, to stand in His presence, to be in that, to bring everybody there as well. Well, he, they should be the preparation for that. But you come there as a leader, you stand, and they will stand with you. Proclamation means that you start and say things that you believe. God, like that is the preaching, I think it refers to that. Yeah, the proclamation. Yeah. Then dedication means Prophecy. that is your side. After the sermon, what do you do then? Oh, the Lord has called us all to do this and, 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 and ask for forgiveness and to rededicate our lives to Him. That's the dedication. That involves a lot of prayers. That one is sermon, that one involves prayers. It doesn't need to be in this. It um, can be other way around as well. You can dedicate God right before you hear a sermon. It doesn't need to be strictly like that. And then benediction, sorry that E has been left out. Mm. Benediction means to speak out the blessing of God. And in the olden days they believed in, in certain churches, you have to raise your hands and say a few words in, uh, in a different kind of voice. That's not what God wants. God wants you to be just bless the people if you want to bless them. So go and ask for the blessing of God in your heart. That could be enough to say that. Just to speak blessing out of the people. Yeah. You don't have to work for, work also for a Sunday to do that. No. Okay, we are out of time, but um, I think we should leave it there. We already have past nine, so we can carry on at oh, lesson two.
Is it uh, lesson page three? four. Is it lesson three, page four? Yeah, I think that's a mistake. Sorry, yeah. that should be lesson three, page four. No, yeah, just double checking. Just uh, whoa. Okay. No, that's lesson three. Okay. Sorry, no, this is a printing mistake or a, rather a typing mistake. So we we will carry on with lesson three, page four next time. Thank you.